VOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have reports about a new statue in Rome, a boy who found a way to light his tent in Gaza, the return of the SAT, and a creative way to discuss the act of getting married. We hope you stay with us. John Russell is up first with this story. Emperor Constantine I was an ancient Roman ruler who welcomed Christianity. He helped spread the religion throughout the Roman Empire. Recently, a large, rebuilt statue of Constantine was introduced to the public in Rome. Officials revealed the 13-meter copy of the statue that Constantine had built for himself. Special technology known as 3D modeling permitted the statue's makers to create the work from scans of the nine large original marble body parts that remain. The result? A large statue of the seated emperor. Constantine is wearing special clothing and holding a scepter and orb. He looks over Rome from a side garden of the Capitoline Museums. The rebuilt statue is close to the area where the original pieces of Constantine's giant feet, hands, and head are kept. Artists in Rome created the original about 1,700 years ago. Rebuilt to its original form, the statue creates wonder in people who see it. This feeling is just what Constantine wanted from his subjects, officials said at the statue's public introduction. In this statue there's not just beauty, there's the violence of power, said Salvatore Setis of the Fondazione Prada, the cultural and educational arm of the fashion house which financed the project. Officials did not say how much the project cost, but the Factum Foundation created the statue. The group is a non-profit based in Madrid. It creates special digital copies of the world's famous cultural objects. This whole dynamic about how you use technology to transform our understanding of and the importance of cultural heritage is the core mission of Factum Foundation, said the group's founder, Adam Lowe. The statue is made from several materials. The body includes resin, polyurethane, and marble powder. Gold leaf and plaster make up the special clothing that goes over the body. A second version of the statue is to be put in place in northeast England. That is where Constantine guarded defenses known as Hadrian's Wall before being crowned emperor in Rome. I'm John Russell. A 15-year-old boy in Gaza was able to build a device to provide electricity to light the tent he is staying in with his family. Hussam al-Attar got two fans at a resale market and used them to create small wind turbines to produce electricity. His invention led others in the camp where he stays to start calling him the Newton of Gaza. 
The comparison involves the English scientist Isaac Newton. Newton is known for his major scientific discoveries in the fields of physics, mathematics, and astronomy more than 300 years ago. A famous story about Newton describes how an apple falling on his head led him to discover the nature of gravity. Newton was sitting under an apple tree when an apple fell on his head and he discovered gravity, Al Attar told Reuters news agency. And we here are living in darkness and tragedy and rockets are falling on us. Therefore, I thought of creating light and did so, he added. al Attar is staying with his family in a tent in Rafa, a city on the southern edge of the Gaza Strip, near the border with Egypt. Reuters reported that Rafa currently holds more than half of Gaza's total population of 2.3 million people. Large numbers of people fled to the area from other parts of Gaza to escape fighting between Israeli forces and Hamas fighters. The fighting has been ongoing since Hamas militants invaded southern Israel from Gaza on October 7th. Israeli officials say the invasion left 1,200 people dead and 253 kidnapped. Israel immediately began a large military campaign to answer the actions of Hamas. Israeli military officials have said their goal is to crush the Palestinian Islamist group. Local health officials in Gaza say the fighting has killed more than 27,000 people across the territory and caused displacement and hunger. al Attar and his family are staying in a tent that is partly attached to a house. He was able to climb onto the roof to set up two fans, one above the other. The wind can turn the fans, which produce small amounts of electricity. He then connected the fans to wires and built a charging station. al Attar also built switches to control a lighting system made out of wood. He said his first two attempts failed, and it took him a while to develop a working system. I started developing it further, bit by bit, until I was able to extend the wires through the room to the tent that we are living in, so that the tent will have light. al Attar added that he was happy to be able to create something to help ease the suffering of his family members. He said he is looking forward to the future when conditions can improve in Gaza. I am very happy that people in this camp call me Gaza's Newton, al Attar said. He added, because I hope to achieve my dream of becoming a scientist like Newton and creating an invention that will benefit not only the people of the Gaza Strip, but the whole world. I'm Brian Lynn. Dartmouth College, the Ivy League University in New Hampshire, announced last week that it will again require standardized tests from applicants. American students who wish to attend Dartmouth starting in the fall of 2025, will need to send SAT or ACT scores with their applications. Students from other parts of the world will need to submit results from an equivalent standardized national exam, according to Dartmouth. 
the university suspended its consideration of standardized tests for four years. In 2020, Dartmouth and many other American universities entered a test-optional period, which officials said was because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Starting in the spring of 2020, schools increasingly stopped holding in-person classes. That made it difficult for students to prepare for and gather to take standardized tests. Many universities used the test optional period to find out what would happen if they no longer required the SAT and ACT. Years before, a few studies said that the tests favored wealthy students. Nat Smittable is with Ivy Wise, a company that offers college admissions advice in New York City. Smittable said universities want a diverse group of students and were not sure they were getting enough of them by looking at standardized tests. Dartmouth said it looked at its group of accepted students after four years. It found the test optional policy increased the number of applications, but made it harder to find the best students. The university said it discovered standardized test scores were a valuable element of Dartmouth's undergraduate application. In addition, the university said the tests expanded its ability to identify talent. That means the tests made it easier for Dartmouth to find good students who do not come from rich families or wealthy high schools. Dartmouth joins Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as top schools again requiring standardized test scores. Currently, Yale University in Connecticut, Harvard University, and Duke University in North Carolina still permit students to apply without test results. They are all highly selective schools. But some experts wonder if those schools will follow Dartmouth. Smittable at Ivy Wise said most students still take the SAT or ACT, but he said most do not understand that they can still apply to schools such as Dartmouth, even if their scores are a little low. An average SAT score is 1,050, while 1,600 is perfect. There's kids that won't break 1,000 that can absolutely do the work at a Penn or a Harvard or any of these places. There's no doubt about it. Smittable said a student with good grades who is an immigrant or whose parents did not go to college should almost always submit their test scores. If you score a 1,400 or above, and you're the first in your family to go to college, that would be an astronomical score, he said. And really, quite frankly, that's, that's way more impressive than a 1,550 from a student, you know, like from an affluent background. Many students, however, say they like the freedom of choosing whether to send their scores to other schools. Renee Bischoff is the Director of College Counseling at Hawkins School, a high school near Cleveland, Ohio. She said she has some students who are good at lots of things, theater, sports, leadership activities, teaching younger students, or performing community service. But they are not good at taking standardized tests. If they choose to apply to a college that does not need a test score, they can put their energy into other things. She said some students 
were taking tests five times in an effort to raise their scores. I will say to them, you know what? You shouldn't spend the extra time. Don't spend the money. Don't spend your Saturday. Focus your time on doing the things that are deeply meaningful to you and work hard in school. That will be the leading thing, and the testing isn't required, so let's not spend all our time and money on that. Barry Maloney is the president of Worcester State University in Massachusetts. He wrote an opinion piece for the Telegram and Gazette, a local newspaper, about test-optional admission. For colleges like his, he wrote, a student's grades are the best predictor of their success. If a standardized test is something you don't want to take for admission for any reason, you simply don't need to, he wrote. Christiana Coloco is a senior at Annandale High School in Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. She was born in the African nation of Sierra Leone and moved to the U.S. as a girl. She was accepted to a number of colleges already, but did not send her test scores. She said she tried her best on the tests, but she felt intimidated and confused. She did not take a test preparation class like some students. However, Coloco has done well in school and taken part in many clubs and activities. She has a job to help support her family. She is the president of her school's Bible study club and takes part in Heritage Night, where she teaches people about her country. Coloco said she liked the fact that she could still get into a good college without doing well on the tests. It gives me a sense of peace knowing that if I were to study my hardest and try my best and still maybe not get such a great score, it wouldn't completely ruin my chances of getting into that college. She applied to the University of Virginia and James Madison University and did not send her test scores. She will find out if she has been accepted later this spring. Laura Wells is the AVID program coordinator at Annandale. The program identifies students who could do well in college, but they need extra support in order to succeed in more difficult classes. The program also gives extra help and direction on college applications. Wells helps students such as Coloco, who were not born in the U.S., or whose parents do not speak English. Wells said her students usually have trouble with the tests, but the ones who get straight A's, the very top grades, go on to do well in college. Even if top schools require test scores, she said it is important that other schools remain test optional. The students she works with still need to believe they can go to a good college. For her, such schools in Virginia include the University of Virginia, UVA, and Virginia Tech. But I do hope that schools like, you know, UVA, Virginia Tech, you know, still choose to be test optional because otherwise it, it is really hard, I think, for students to kind of see themselves at those schools. They can accept the fact that they might not get into Dartmouth or Georgetown or Johns Hopkins or something, right? But you should have a shot at being able to go to your top-ranked state school. Yeah? That's what I think anyway. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. And now... Words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give you definitions, examples, notes on usage, 
and sometimes we even use them in a conversation. Valentine's Day is February 14th. Because it is close to that day that celebrates lovers, we talk today about a romantic idiom, tie the knot. To tie the knot is an informal term for getting married. In some marriage ceremonies, a knot is actually tied around the couple's hands with a piece of cloth or ribbon. This is done as a symbol of unity. This wedding tradition can be called a hand fasting ceremony. Several websites claim that this is an ancient Celtic wedding tradition. The couple holds hands while someone else ties their hands together with material. This represents the two people being physically and spiritually tied to each other. But let's go back to the word knot. A knot is an interlacing of string, ribbon, rope, or similar material that forms a connection between two or more loose ends. The word knot can also describe a mass or lump of disordered material that is tangled. Some knots are hard to untangle. For example, if your hair has knots, the ends have become tangled together, and it cannot be straightened or combed. When talking about hair, having knots is not a good thing. Knowing how to tie knots is important in many activities, including sailing. For example, rope is used to secure sails. While sailing, you might want ropes to stay knotted at times. But you also need to be able to release the knots quickly at a moment's notice. With a marriage, you want to stay knotted together. You do not want the bond to be easily broken. There are other ways to say to tie the knot. In a formal situation, you can say two people have been wed. A very informal expression is to get hitched. Now let's hear two friends use the expression to tie the knot. Hey, I have a wonderful secret about our good friends, Finn and Polly. They are tying the knot next month. What? Finn and Polly? Are you sure? Yes. Polly told me last week while we were bowling. She's on my bowling team. I cannot believe that. Well, believe it. But she made me promise not to say a word. So don't tell anyone. I am shocked. Why? Finn and Polly have been dating for years. I'm not shocked about that. Polly bowls? I had no idea. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo talk about an expression people sometimes use when talking about weddings. Welcome to the show, Anna. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Anna, can you remind our listeners about the expression you discussed this week? Yes, Dan. This week, I wrote about the expression to tie the knot. Some people have probably heard it before if they have been to a wedding with people who speak English. Maybe they have heard the expression in a movie or television program, too. It is a casual way of saying to get married. Anna, I have heard that expression lots of times. In fact, I probably said it a few times in 2022 since I got married later that year. However, 
I didn't really know the story behind the phrase. What can you tell us about it? Well, we think this expression comes from an old Celtic wedding tradition where the hands of the couple were bound together. Anna, that sounds like a nice way to represent the connection the couple has to each other. It is a lifelong commitment, but hopefully they can untie the knot because it would not be easy to live that way. I think they do untie the knot pretty quickly. After all, it would be hard to eat the wedding cake with one hand tied to your partner. And think about dancing. They could get hurt. Well, I guess you can have very small cakes that you can eat with one hand. That would solve the problem. Anna, can you tell us about some other situations where people might have to tie knots? Well, children learn to tie their shoes, and some children tie them in a knot, which can be difficult for a parent who wants to get those shoes off in a hurry. Also, in my story, I talk about sailing. That is a very common sport or activity where tying knots is very important because you have to tie down the sails on the sailboat. Also, I think rock climbers need to use certain type of knots when they are climbing rocks. And I believe if you join certain outdoor clubs, like the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, you may have to show that you know different knots. There are many different styles of knots. That reminds me of my knot situation. I used to belong to a rowing center in Washington, D.C., and one night there was a really strong storm that tore a hole in the roof of the building where we kept the boats. That's called the boathouse. Now, some of the boats are stored on very high racks. Some are placed about 10 meters off the ground. And the boats are very costly. So when we put the boats back, we used a lot of long pieces of rope to tie them down, just in case the wind started blowing again. And we had to use some special knots that would keep the boats in place but also not be too hard to release. That is a situation, Dan, where you would need some really good knots. That's true, Anna. And it worked out pretty well. Some people were good at tying the knots. I was not really that good. It took some practice. But Anna, you know, we forgot to mention one of my favorite kinds of knots. Dan, I did not know that you had a favorite knot. I don't know anyone who has a favorite knot, actually. What is it? It's a pretzel, of course. I really like pretzels. Oh, right. Yes, the pretzel knot. That is a very good and tasty kind of knot. Well, Anna, I feel like we better not spend too much time talking about knots. We should probably say goodbye for now. Thanks for joining us today, Anna. You're welcome, Dan. It would not be a good week without stopping by to your podcast. Haha, <laughs> get it? Not is spelled with a K. A anyway, have a good day. Thanks, Anna. It's always great to have you on the podcast. Speaking of today's podcast, we also heard from John Russell about a new statue in Rome. Then Brian Lynn told us about the boy lighting his family's tent in Gaza. And Katie helped me with the story about Dartmouth College bringing back the SAT and ACT. And then, of course, we heard from Anna, who told us all about tying the knot. We also have to thank all of our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. 
I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.